Hebrews 11, great chapter, the faith chapter is what many call it. The problem is, so many of these stories seem repeti- repetitious. Like, you know, I keep, you, you, you hear it in the same kind of the sim- similar stories over and over. There's this pattern, you know, that you see, especially the last couple sermons we talked about that. And with Abraham, it's going to be the same thing. We repeat this pattern. And so I kind of defined it, the pattern like this. First of all, there's faith, right? By faith, Abel, you know, he had faith. And that's what the chapter is telling us. Uh, By faith, Enoch, he walked with God and he was not. By faith, uh, and now we're talking about Abraham, you know, so all these are faith. So the first one, these are all F's, all right? I did a little bit of uh, alliteration this time. Faith, right? And then that, after that faith, what we see is fear. They're moved with fear. We sp- specifically saw that with Noah. The faith caused him to move with fear. And, of course, God, God gave, him something to, gave them something to do, a job to do. And when you have faith in the Lord and you're wanting to follow him and you're wanting to know what's next in your life, God's going to give you a job to do. Right? That's the way to put that faith into action, which brings us to the next step. Uh, and I had to find an F to fit in there, so I got forward motion. Right, So you got your faith, you got fear. I love how Thursday night Pastor Anderson tied fear in with humility because they really do. They go hand in hand. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and, one, and, and of wisdom, the Bible also says. And so when you have that fear of the Lord... That causes you to obey and to do the work that he's called you to do. And that's all tied together with fear and humility. And so, uh, so you got your faith, then you got fearing the Lord, and then you got forward motion. That should be the pattern. And we see that over and over. Abel, he had faith. And what did he do? He, he obeyed. And the Bible doesn't give a lot of details, but it seems to me like somewhere down the road, he was taught that he had to bring a, a sacrifice of a lamb. And that's what God would be, you know, that would please God. And so he moved with, with faith, he did that. And it's funny, I mean, he, he doesn't live very much longer after that, right? Because Cain kills him. But what do we have? The Bible says, and he yet speaketh, right? So even today, that obedience that he took and that, that acting on the faith, even today, it's still a blessing. He, and we're still learning from that. And we're still preaching on it all the time. All right, Enoch. He walked with God, and again, we don't know all the stories, but we know that he was a preacher, and he said, uh, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of angels, and he was already prophesying. He was taking the word of God, and God apparently called him to preach. And he was walking with God. It says he pleased God, but what does Hebrews say? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So how did he get that testimony uh, where he pleased God? Well, he lived by faith, and he did what God told him to do by faith. And so he acted on that. And then Noah, we see that he was a preacher of righteousness in 2 Peter 2, 5. So Hebrews says, by faith, he acted upon, you know, being warned of God uh, about things to come. He didn't know. Had never really rained. The Bible says a mist was coming up from the ground. Hadn't really rained. So he doesn't understand how in the world the world's going to be flooded by this this rain that God was talking about. But he moves, uh, he acts upon God's word uh, through faith. And what does he do? The Bible says in this case he condemns the world. You know, I think he preached and he probably said, you can be saved. But they rejected and only his family got saved, physically saved on that, that ark. And so we see here that the pattern continues with Abraham. And something interesting I find, you're there in Hebrews 11, Abraham kind of gets some extra verses. Did you notice that? The other guys get like one verse. And when we get to Abraham, we got verse 8. Right By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whether he went. And then you see nine, by faith, he sojourned. So it's still talking about Abraham. Uh, it stops and it says uh, he looked for a city. And then it talks about Sarah for a minute. And then it says, uh, uh, by faith, verse, seven, uh, by, uh, verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. All uh, right, and so all those verses, all the way to verse 19 there, is talking about Abraham. Now, he doesn't get as many verses as Moses, but we're not there yet. So when we get to Moses, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll deal more with that. But you ever wonder, like, why is, why is Abraham get so much attention here? And really, in the Bible, doesn't Abraham get a lot of focus? I mean, even... Uh, 
Even in the New Testament, there's so much reference to Abraham. And, and one of the things is this, Abraham, uh, you've probably heard of what's called the Abrahamic religions, right? So the, obviously the three top religions that would be tied to Abraham would be what? Christianity, Judaism, of course, and then uh, Islam, right? These all tie to Abraham as their father. And there's a lot of off, you know, offshoots of those. But all these embrace Abraham as like their father. I remember whenever I was uh, uh, getting ready to become the pastor in Iola, I sat down with some of the guys, and y'all know Brother Webb. Uh, he's doing pretty good, by the way, still in the nursing home and, and all, but he's, uh, he's getting around still mentally sharp, 92 years old, still kicking and, and still sharp as a tack. Uh, but I remember he sat down with me before I became the pastor, and, uh, and he, said, uh, he said, do you know, he was like, he went through this time of like wanting to quiz me and he was like, one of the first questions he asked was, he said, do you know who the first Jew was? And I was thinking of all these answers I could have given him that probably wasn't what he was looking for. And I was like, I think I know what he's looking for. And I was like, I, was like, I guess you're saying Abraham, first Jew. He started the Jewish, Jewish faith. And, and so, uh, <laughs> so uh, anyway, I won't, I won't get off on that. But, but he was just, he was talking about how, how Abraham started that that whole faith. And then I've met Muslims before, and honestly, I haven't studied Islam probably as much as I should, but, but I've met a lot of Muslims, and they've tried to share you know, their beliefs. And what I found very interesting, the first time I ever talked to a Muslim, I was trying to tell them about the Bible. I remember trying to talk to them about, about Isaac, you know, and how Abraham was going to offer Isaac, but he said, I'll provide for myself a lamb. And I was telling that story, and they said, no, no, no. He offered Ishmael. And they just totally changed the story, and everything that is associated with Isaac, they've got Ishmael in there. And so the, it's a similar story, but it's just kind of changed up. And so, but all these religions of the, uh, of the world are claiming Abraham as their kind of founder. And that makes sense because go back to Genesis 17. Genesis 17, and we'll show you, there's a lot of verses here that calls Abraham the father of many nations. Genesis 17. It says, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called uh, Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. All right, and he goes on there talking about that. He says, uh, I'm establishing this covenant. You know, you're going to go into this land. You're going to be a stranger, which is what we see in Hebrews 11. Right? I find it very interesting that he doesn't see the fulfillment of those prophecies in his lifetime. But you know, there's one day that he will see those promises fulfilled when he's resurrected and actually lives in the promise. I really believe that. And a lot of these Old Testament saints never saw that physical fulfillment. But they, I'm talking about the ones who God actually promised that they would see that, will see that. I don't know if you know where I'm going with that, but a lot of people think those, those, these promises are yet to be fulfilled. And really, they, they are going to be fulfilled with the ones that he promised that to. But some have broken off where God removed his, his hand on that nation. And the physical blessings, I do not believe, are in what, what we think of Israel today. So, uh, but, but all these promises were to Abraham and to his seed. Now keep that in mind. Let's go to Genesis 12. Not only is Abraham called the father of many nations, Abraham's called uh, to be a blessing. He says, I will bless you. And he says, by you all, na all the nations shall be blessed. Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord had seen, had, I'm sorry, the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. 
Now, you can't help but go to Galatians 3 after you read that. And here's the thing. I remember not that long ago, uh, maybe a couple, no, I don't know if it's a couple years or what, but, uh, but Trump uh, established, or I don't know how, how you'd say that, but he said that Jerusalem would be the capital of Israel, and they set up the, uh, uh, I don't know what's, what they call the place. Anyway, <laughs> they set, set that up. What's that? Yeah, they set up the embassy, thank you, there in Jerusalem. And that was a big deal. And, and I think I mentioned this before, but somewhere they actually have a coin with Trump's face on it, and it actually refers to him as Cyrus. Because, you know, like Israel prophesied that Cyrus would come and, and, the, and the people would go back into the land and it would be restored, which it was, you know, when they went back in Ezra's day with Zerubbabel. And, uh, and it was, in a way, they went back into the land because of Cyrus and all that. But anyway, so actually, a lot of people are saying, like, Trump is our Cyrus, and he's going to help us build the temple, and we're going to go back in the land and all that kind of stuff. And when he had that, uh, he had some kind of big meeting, and all the big shots were there. A lot of people from the U.S. were there. A lot of people from Israel were there. And all these representatives were there where he was, uh, they had this big speech, and then they had a few different guys get up to pray. One of them, obviously, was a Jewish, you know, uh, a person that got up there and he prayed. And then one of them was Robert Jeffries. And I don't know if anyone knows who that is. Uh, he's got a TV show and all that. But he, he's a Baptist preacher, uh, I think Southern Baptist. But he got up there to lead the prayer. And, he, and he, in his prayer, he was saying, well, our Father, we... Uh, we, he, was, he was going on and just kind of slobbering all over the Israel and everything. But he was saying, my father, uh, he, said, he said, you said in Genesis 12 that in Abraham would all the nations be blessed. And I thought, he's going to give them the gospel. He's going to lead them to Christ. He's going to tell them. And that was fulfilled in Christ. And he said, you said that that would happen. And indeed, he said, we have seen all that Israel has given to the world. And he started listing out some different things. And I'm like, please mention Christ. Please mention Christ. No mention of Christ. <laughs> Until the very end, I think he said something about Christ, but he didn't associate it with that promise. Now look at Galatians 3. Galatians 3. Because the fact of the matter is, Abraham never saw that land. His seed, you know, they went into that land. But did you notice that? They just kept sinning. He kept saying, if you go and land, and if you do this, and you do this, I'll bless you. And then they didn't do it, so he would curse them, right? And then they would fall, they'd be punished for a while, then a new group would come up, and they'd have a heart for the Lord, and they'd do right. And then it wouldn't be long, they'd fall again, and they'd disobey. And so he'd curse them again until you get to Ezekiel, and he basically, the glory of the Lord departs from them. It says, I'm, you know, I'm done. And, uh, and anyway, uh, so all that happens... And then Jesus comes on the scene years later, uh, and here was the prof prophecy fulfilled. Galatians 3 talks about that. I forgot to turn there. Are you already there? Galatians chapter 3. And let's start in verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith... The same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And if that's not clear enough, let's go on. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law, to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. I mean, you can't get any more clear than that. Jesus was fulfilling that promise. The, he was the seed of Abraham physically, right? He was the physical seed of Abraham. But spiritually, 
He was the father of all those who would come to him by faith. Right? And so, so you can't get any, any clearer than that. And so Abraham is our father. If you're a believer, if you've come to Christ, you can say, Abraham's our father. I'm not talking of, that doesn't make you a Zionist, right? That means you're saying, hey, Father Abraham had many sons. I am one of them, so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. <laughs> Remember that song from Vacation Bible School? <laughs> All right, so, so Abraham gets kind of like some special treatment here in Hebrews, and I think partly, and so much of the Bible talks about him, because God said, through you, I'm going to bless the world. But obviously, he said uh, he was talking about Christ, and through, through Christ, all that was fulfilled. All those promises were fulfilled. Okay, so, the, so here's the thing, though. Go back to Hebrews 11. And for this message, what I want to focus on in verse 8 there, by faith, Abraham. And we'll talk a little bit about Abraham again next week, but today I want to look at this just as first. By faith, Abraham, when he was called... I'm sorry, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. And so the title of the message is called to go out, right? So you got faith. If you don't have faith, you can't even be saved. But if, you have, if you've got faith, you place your faith in Christ, then you're saved. What comes next? I said fear. You got faith. That moves you to fear. I'm going to obey the Lord because I have faith, uh, not only that He exists, but I have faith that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. I have faith that he, He'll chastise those who don't follow Him and don't live for Him, right? If they're His children. I have faith, and that faith is going to move me to act upon, uh, I'm sorry, I have fear that's going to cause me to act upon that faith. And to what I said, the third thing, forward motion. You know, God's never going to call you to just sit still and do nothing. He's always going to call, call you to go, right? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. That's a, that's a command to go. I mean, you, you can't just say, okay, well, he, he saved me, and now, you know, I'm just going to sit here and soak up the Bible, and I'm going to get smarter, and I'm going to, you know, watch, watch YouTube videos, and I'm just going to just soak all this. No, he's, he wants to give you a job to do. So if you believe in him and you have fear for him, He's going to put that to the test so you can get stuff accomplished for him. And he's going to give you a big job to do. And by faith, you've got to go out and do it. When he called Abraham to go, Abraham had no clue. He was raised in the same town with his father and his family for all these years. Had a lot of wealth. If you follow, you see whenever he travels, he's got all this wealth that he's taken with him. And he has all that, and he's going into the unknown. And you can almost see him like asking God, like, you know, so what, what's going to happen exactly? Like, what's my next step? What's up ahead? Where am I going to live? What am I going to... And, and it's like God is saying, I'm going to tell you when you get there. You just go. Right? And you say, well, that's just, I just don't know about blind faith. I don't know. Like, I, I think that God would give us a plan. And, and uh, you know, I think about this. I think this is a good illustration. <laughs> Let me play this out, okay? I've seen a few people with Alzheimer's. Anybody have family members with Alzheimer's? Didn't you, that wasn't your grandma? She's not, she doesn't have Alzheimer's, right? Anybody known somebody with Alzheimer's? Uh, you know, and, I, <laughs> and so uh, you've been through that. And uh, Valerie's uh, grand, granddad had Alzheimer's, faithful missionary for many years, served the Lord, loved the Lord. And in the end of his life, he had this Alzheimer's, which it seems like, you know, like Pastor Anderson was talking about the worst thing that could happen is that, is that your mind would get messed up, which I don't think was a punishment by, by God for him, but I'm just saying that's a terrible thing because you don't know what you're doing. And one thing I noticed about him and all Alzheimer's patients, we have a nursing home ministry, and when we go to the nursing home ministry, if someone has Alzheimer's, you know what they're doing? They're in their wheelchair or whatever, and they're right by the door. And as soon as you come in, they want to leave, right? And every time you talk to them, they're like, I can't find my, key, my car keys. I need to go. I need to go. They always feel like there's something I need to do. Like there's something. And so like I need to go to my house. I need to go. They always feel like there's something I need to do. So if you were able, actually going to take them, okay, you want to go to your house, put them in a car. And if you went to their house and you took them to their house, they'd say, I got to go. I got to go somewhere. I need to go somewhere. There's just this constant mentality of I got to go and I got to do something. And they don't even really know what it is. <laughs> right? But they just, there's this sense of urgency. There's a sense of, i got to get something accomplished. And I thought about this. Uh, there's a couple stories in the Bible where Jesus sends people out and uh, really doesn't give them a lot of information about what they're going to have and, and what the path is going to be in front of them. Look at Ma Matthew chapter 10. 
Matthew chapter 10 is the first place where he sends out the disciples. And look at verse 9. Matthew 10, verse 9. Here's what he tells them. Uh, Well, let me back up to verse... uh, uh, He tells them where to go. Let's go to verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm not going to stop and take time to explain all that, but here's verse 7. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. But here's the thing that I find interesting. He says, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Now, in one, in one sense, God wants us to be wise stewards of his money, and why stewards of the resources that he gives us. And so, you know, there's all, obviously, you got to take care of your family. There's a command on that. Like, if you don't take care of your family, you're worse than an infidel. Uh, Obviously, he talks about, you know, who's going to build a house and not count the cost beforehand, you know, but you got to have a plan. And, And so I'm not talking about just making dumb decisions and just throwing caution to the wind necessarily. But do you see where there's a sense of, of these guys are going to act by faith. And I know this was a particular group of people that he had called, these 12 disciples, that he gave this mission to. But he's like, oh, yeah, and when you go to preach the gospel and you go to do this thing, he's like, yeah, don't even worry about what you're going to say. Don't even take two coats. Don't even take extra money. Don't take anything. Just go, and I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to give you the things to say, and I'm going to lead you to the next step, and I'm going to make sure you have a place to, to live and all that. You just have to step out in faith and follow me. And that's how Jesus was with his disciples, right? He was hard on his disciples. Now, he had mercy for everybody that came to him. Right? All the multitudes, he would heal them. He would help them. He would give them spiritual training and spiritual help, and physical help. But those disciples, man, he was, like, he was, he was basically telling them, this is, you're going to have a rough life. People are going to persecute you. Be happy about it. You're not going to have anything. You're going to be poor. Be happy about it. <laughs> and, he's saying, and you're like, man, I don't want to follow Christ, that's going to be a rough life. But you don't see that. With everybody that follows Christ and they actually have that faith, He does take care of them. And He does give them the peace that they need in times of trouble, in time of persecution. And He does provide for them. And, you know, and I've thought about here recently losing some friends for various reasons that we won't get into right now, but everybody knows. <laughs> but it's like every time I, I lose a friend, like I'm like, man, that really hurts, right? I get like five new friends that love the Lord and, and encourage me and want me to, you know, to, to live for the Lord. And so, like, that's not even, like, I don't sorrow about that. You see what I'm saying? You just go by faith and do what God's called you to do, and you keep on living the life He's called you to live. And so, uh, Luke chapter 10, he does the same thing. Look at Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, look at verse 3. Well, let's just start with verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. Okay, now he's got 70 disciples that he's sending out. He sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Doesn't that sound familiar? Sends them out by twos, right? There's some good biblical reasons for going out in twos. And it's not just uh, Je- Jehovah's Witnesses that do that, but, but it's, 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 some, it's wisdom, you know, accountability, and, and uh, two heads are better than one, that kind of an idea. Verse 2, therefore, he said, uh, therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. That's what I pray all the time. You know, that's what I prayed as soon as I became the pastor, and actually before that, that's what I was praying in Iola, send laborers. You know, and I, I didn't think they would come through, through many of you folks, but I really feel like that's God's answer to prayer for me in my life. Laborers that I can get linked up with and we can work together and I can help to, to lead, lead you guys. And he says, go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. And he says the same thing he said to the twelve. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, anyway, it gets into a whole lot of stuff. But you see the same idea there. He's like, don't go prepared. Don't go, uh, and again, I want to remind you once again that 
yes, God is a God of order, and He wants you to be prepared in, in certain ways, and don't just make stupid decisions and stuff like that. But this, the mentality of living by faith, the mentality of saying, hey, I can do that, and even though in my mind I can't reason out what the end result's going to be, if the Lord's calling me to do it, I'm going to do it, and He's going to take care of me each step of the way. He's going to provide what I need, and He's going to help uh, uh, make sure that I get to the end. I can testify that I've seen that in my own life. Now, I've made the stupid decisions too, but <laughs> sometimes by faith, I've just gone out and said, Lord, I think you want me to do this, and I'm going to do it, and I, I know it sounds... It doesn't seem like it makes sense, but I know you'll help me and you'll provide for me. And he's provided every step of the way. And he's helped and he's given that peace and that reassurance because some of the biggest stuff isn't necessarily not having resources or not knowing what in the future is, but it's just this peace of mind. I mean, don't you want peace of mind? Just know it's comfort, right? You want to be comfortable. And you don't want, I mean, you don't want stress. You don't want this, this you don't want worry and stuff like that. Well, if you're following the Lord... And especially if you've learned by experience that, hey, if I take one step toward the Lord, He takes a step toward me. Take another step towards Him, and we get so close that He's leading me on my life. Now, one of the things that I've got asked when I worked with teens, it was this way, a lot. Probably a lot more with teens than it is uh, with older folks. But, uh, but in my life, I've been asked this many times. Uh, uh, Joshua, the guy that helps set up these chairs and everything, has asked me the same question outside these doors. And he said, how do I know... I'm in the will of God. How do I know what God's will is for my life? Now, I don't even think I need to ask for a show of hands, but hasn't everybody in this room felt that at one time or another? Like, how do I know that's what God wants me to do? So my advice is always this. Number one, rely on the Bible. Do what you know the Bible is telling you to do. If it's not in the Bible, if it's contrary to the Bible, you know that's not God's will. So that's a comfort, right? <laughs> you say, I really want to do this, but the Bible says I'm not supposed to do that. You know that's not God's will. But on the other things, you have a heart that wants to serve the Lord and wants to live right for the Lord, and, uh, and you, you're expecting Him to show you what the next step is, well, the just shall live by faith. You live by faith, and uh, you just expect and pray that He'll open doors and He'll shut doors, and He'll do that. And you just otherwise live like that Alzheimer's patient just saying, I don't know what's next. I don't know what's next. And I can relate because I think I'm getting Alzheimer's. I really do. But <laughs> I don't know what's next, but I know i got to go do something. And the Lord opens up a door. All right? Well, go do that. Do, go do it. And, uh, and you mess, you'll make some mistakes, but he'll help, he'll help uh, uh, get you back on track. And, uh, and anyway, just, just live with the urgency that says, i got to get some work done for the Lord. I said this a while back. I don't remember what the message was exactly, but uh, yeah, I was talking about second men. I preached a message called second men, and I was telling the guys here, I know it's, it's a little bit difficult. I'm still learning how to be a leader, and there's a little extra challenge with trying to lead and care for you guys from, from so far away, but I'm like, here, if you don't know what to do, right, you prioritize and say, well, what's the most important thing I could do for the Lord, and what would that be? I'd say soul winning. <laughs> so if you don't know what to do, like, I want to serve the Lord, but... You know, I don't know what the next step is. Hey, find a way to get plugged into soul winning. You, know, you don't have to necessarily be the talker. You don't have to do every, uh, everything that you don't know how to do, but just get linked up with other guys that are doing it. What a blessing to see a uh, church so full of people who do that. And then to fellowship with guys like we did in Sullivan and like we did on last Thursday, of just all these like-minded folks that want to do that. And they're going out, and they can't even ride a bi go on a bicycle ride without stopping and giving somebody the gospel. Man, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. Get plugged into that and live there because, because God's going to see that faith and he's going to see that you're willing to do that and that's what your desire is and he's going to give you more opportunities and more opportunities and more opportunities. And so our job is to go. He's called us to go just like he's called, uh, just like he called Abraham. And we might not always know the next step. We might not, it might seem like we're sacrificing a lot or we're taking on way more than we could possibly handle. Uh, but if we really know that it's, it's what the Lord's leading us to and it's, a, uh, it's something that's going to help and benefit uh, the kingdom of God, go do it. So let's try to be men and women of faith and to follow this pattern. Live by faith. The just shall live by faith and, and, and just walk by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So live in faith. That faith is going to move you to fear. I'm talking about a healthy fear, not a fear where you're just, you know, 
you don't want to leave your house because you're afraid of <laughs> you know, what's going to happen. But a fear that says, man, God is going to chase me if I don't live for him. God is going to, you know, uh, uh, man, bring me to all those diseases. Pastor Anderson talked about on Thursday. That was pretty graphic and pretty challenging, right? Uh, I want to live for the Lord, and I want to be a conduit, you know, where, I, where he can do the work through me and, uh, and to help other people and lead people to the Lord and all that. Okay, and then so the final thing is just our forward motion. Just keep moving forward. You know, I've heard somebody say one time in your Christian life, if you're standing still, you're actually moving backwards because he's called you to go. He's called you to get momentum and keep, and keep growing. Now, there's going to be times in our life where we move backwards and we got to get up and get back on track and move forward. But there is no standing still. You're not accomplishing anything if you're standing still. You got to keep moving forward. <laughs> Capitalize on any of the opportunities that come your way. If you're, if you're in, walking in the Spirit and you're of a sound mind, you'll recognize those times when they come. And again, I get questions all the time. People want to know, like, how do I know what to do? I'm like, well, why don't you first start living by faith, doing the things you know you're supposed to do. Read your Bible, you know, pray, go to church, show up for soul winning. And, and when, once you get closer to doing those types of things, the Lord's going to start making things in your life so clear. This is what I want you to do. And he's going to give you that opportunity. Uh, and just like, just like Noah, great job he gave him, just like Abraham, and just like uh, all these characters we're going to read about in the Bible, uh, he's got a job for you. You just got to do it by faith. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and the encouragement that comes from so many examples. Lord, we get to see the negative things they did, and we get to learn by those, and we get to see the good things uh, that men and women did, and we can try to um, uh, follow that example and live for you by faith so that you can get, accomplish the work through us. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to do that. Help this work uh, to grow in, uh, in our, uh, our ability to reach others and to see souls saved. And we do pray you continue to add laborers. And uh, thank you for the guys, even the guys that go out this afternoon. I pray you be with them, fill them with your spirit, Lord, that they might do a mighty work for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.